In 1808, Moravians in North Carolina announced that the upcoming reception of an African-American couple into the congregation would be a private event. That was strange because normally the reception of members was public. The reason for privacy had to do with a distinctive Moravian practice, the kiss of peace. Following Paul's instructions in Romans 16:16 16, 16 and elsewhere, a command I should note we never discussed in youth group, the Moravians received new members with a holy kiss. But in 1808, the Moravian elders declared it would not be seemly to give Negroes the kiss of peace in a public service. This was a shift for the Moravians in North Carolina. A Protestant group founded in Germany, Moravians had done substantial mission work in the Americas, and Moravians proved particularly successful among Native and Black Americans, in part because Moravians, more than many other Protestant groups, learned Native languages, tended not to make converts abandon hunting for farming, often lived with their converts, and allowed converts to exercise religious authority. They also, in the early years, practiced an egalitarianism that was striking in the American context, worshiping in mixed-race churches and exchanging the holy kiss across racial lines. But by the beginning of the 19th century, white Moravians in the South had bowed to their society's racial divisions. White Moravians owned slaves and increasingly worshiped separately from black Moravians. The holy kiss, once a public sign of unity, became a private practice if done across racial lines at all. By the 1920s, it was not done across racial lines. A holy handshake now sufficed. The story of the Moravian reveals much about race in American Christianity during the 18th and early 19th centuries. It speaks to the growing number of African Americans practicing Christianity. It shows that the Christian message could offer a critique of racial division and hierarchy. But it also suggests that Christian churches could enact and normalize racism. In this episode, we'll explore the growth of Christianity among African Americans, particularly in the colonies in the New Republic. We'll see how they use Christianity to protest racial injustice. And we'll consider how Christianity could enforce racial boundaries and support racial hierarchy. In 1816, a group of African American preachers created a new denomination, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. The origins of the new denomination went back to the 18th century in the experience of African American congregates in a mixed race Methodist church in Philadelphia. Richard Allen, one of the AME founders, told the story. One Sunday, the church's white leadership told black congregants that they could no longer pray at the altar with their white fellow believers. When the black congregants knelt at the altar for prayer anyway, white members forcibly removed them. That was it for Allen and the others. We all went out of the church in a body, Allen later wrote, and they were no more plagued with us in the church. Allen's new denomination was one of the forms that black Christianity took in the 19th century. It was sort of remarkable that there were enough black Christians for them to need any form. There were not a lot of black converts to Christianity in the 17th and early 18th centuries. White slave owners were reluctant to evangelize because they feared slaves might need to be freed. Even once laws clarified that baptism did not lead to freedom, Many slave owners were concerned that slaves might think Christianity should lead to manumission. What's more, the groups doing the evangelizing in the 17th and 18th centuries were not very attractive to non-white converts. They tended to preach that slaves should obey their masters, a message that didn't exactly resonate with many slaves. They also didn't offer much by the way of spiritual authority for anyone without an education. Slaves could become, say, Anglican, but they were not going to be able to travel to Oxford to become Anglican priests. The slave trade itself worked against conversion. It's worth stopping here and remembering how many people were affected by the slave trade. Demographers estimate that between 10 and 12 million people were taken from Africa to the Americas, most of whom went to South America. This influx of people meant a continual influx of African religious practices. 
I should note here that there is an old debate among historians about how many African religious practices survived the Middle Passages or the crossing of the Atlantic. The debate's complicated, but for our purposes, I think it's fair to say that many enslaved Africans retained religious practices, even if their religious systems could not survive the horrors of the Middle Passage and the lack of institutional support in the Americas. So for example, some of the enslaved Africans were Muslim. When they were brought to the Americas, they might continue their own prayers or recitation of the Quran, but they didn't have the kind of support, clerics, communal meetings, religious education, necessary to sustain or grow a religious tradition. In any case, throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, many enslaved Africans continued traditional African practices. Continuing influxes of people from Africa reinvigorated those practices, or at least provided options other than Christianity. And then the Great Awakening came. Oh, and here again we have another historical debate. Historians debate a lot of things. We actually enjoy it. I'm going to talk about this thing called the Great Awakening, even though there are some historians that think calling it the Great Awakening overstates how great or widespread it was. Whatever you call it. Around 1740, a series of religious revivals occurred throughout the American colonies. They were led by different people from different denominations, but they were notable for our purposes for the role a new type of Christianity played in them. We call it evangelical Christianity. Now, some of you might think, oh gee, I'm an evangelical. She's talking about my people. Maybe. I know this will shock you, but historians debate, really it's like an illness with us sometimes, whether people who call themselves evangelicals in the 21st century really mean the same thing as the people historians call evangelical in the 18th century. And if you're a part of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, I can tell you right now that I am not talking about 18th century Lutherans. Lutherans, whose traditions comes out of Germany, traditionally use the word evangelical to mean something different than other American evangelicals whose tradition was more influenced by England. In any case, in the mid-18th century, a new kind of Protestant Christianity appeared, and we call it evangelicalism. It was a movement, not a new denomination or church. Evangelicals were Baptist, Methodist, and Presbyterian. Some Anglicans were evangelicals, although not all were. Across those denominational differences, a few beliefs and practices united evangelicals. I'm going to focus for our purposes on two. First, Evangelicals emphasized a conversion experience, or a moment when people experienced themselves being transformed from guilty sinners to justified believers. Second, this experience conferred some degree of spiritual authority. For evangelicals, a converted but uneducated layperson had more spiritual insight than an educated minister who could not get an account of his conversion. There was then, in the DNA of evangelicalism, egalitarianism. If conversion was what counted, social status, education, even gender and race in some cases, didn't. The people who could speak faithfully about God were those who had had, in the words of the famous 18th century preacher Jonathan Edwards, an experience of the divine and supernatural light. As we will see, just because egalitarianism was in evangelical DNA didn't mean that evangelicals were always egalitarian. Not all genes expressed themselves all the time. And that, my friends, is pretty much everything I know about genetics. Still, you can see why this new type of preaching might be attractive to enslaved people. Evangelical revivalist preaching focused on spiritual transformation. Evangelicals acknowledged the spiritual experience and insights of common people. That included both free black people and enslaved people. Great Awakening preachers did not convert vast numbers of African Americans, but during the Great Awakening, evangelicals made inroads into African and African American communities. The first generation of African American preachers came out of the awakening. John Murrent, for example, one of the earliest black preachers whose writings we still have, converted during the awakening under the preaching of George Whitfield, an evangelical revivalist.
And the evangelical message of equality under God began to spread. As we have seen, however, evangelicals were not consistent with their egalitarian message. That leads us back to Richard Allen and the new denomination he founded. Allen was a Methodist, one of the most important groups among the new evangelicals. Methodists were not major players in the American Great Awakening. The founder of Methodism, uh, an Englishman named John Wesley, served briefly as a missionary in Georgia in the 1730s, but he didn't last long. That's another story involving a love affair gone bad. Methodism was first an English movement, but in the 1780s, a few Methodist missionaries came to the newly independent colonies. They brought with them an egalitarian message and an institutional innovation, circuit riders. The way Methodism worked was this. A circuit rider, in early Methodism, usually a young man, traveled around a circuit, preaching at one point on the circuit one week and the next one the next. It was a system almost perfectly designed to evangelize people moving west who could not support settled ministers. You didn't, in Methodism, need a college education in order to be a preacher. You needed a conversion story, a Bible, and a horse. And someone might lend you the horse. Methodist ministers could reach isolated communities with their evangelical message. And originally, the plan was to reach those isolated communities with a racially egalitarian message. John Wesley, Methodism's English founder, opposed slavery. The Methodists in America did too, for several months. When the American Methodists met to organize in 1784, they ruled that white Methodists would need to emancipate their slaves. In other words, they declared that owning slaves was incompatible with Christianity. But just six months later, Methodists reversed that rule. They learned that white people were unwilling to convert if emancipation was part of the package, and that Methodist circuit riders would have no access to slaves if they brought a message of earthly freedom with them. Richard Allen experienced both the egalitarian and the non-egalitarian impulses within Methodism. Born a slave in Philadelphia, Allen was converted by a Methodist preacher and soon began preaching himself. His owner, one of Allen's early converts, decided to allow Allen to purchase his freedom. Allen then took to the Methodist preaching circuit. In the 1780s, he worked closely with Francis Asbury, the major organizer of American Methodism, and a white man. Asbury, like other Methodists, recognized Allen's gifts as a preacher and a leader. In 1786, Allen moved back to Philadelphia and joined St. George's Methodist Church, a predominantly white congregation. Allen's preaching attracted a number of black people to the church. Now, according to Methodist principles, converts of any race were a good thing. But in practice, white Methodists struggled with their black fellow congregants. That struggle led to the infamous encounter in 1787. Black members of St. George's were forcibly pulled from their prayers because they were, according to the white leaders, occupying the wrong seats. Allen and others formed a new congregation called Bethel Church. And then Allen had to work to keep control over his congregation. The white Methodists, while loath to sit next to black Methodists, didn't want black Methodists forming their own denomination over which white folks would have no control. In 1815, Allen sued for Bethel's right to control itself. The state court agreed, and in 1816, Allen formed his new denomination, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. I'm going to pause here for a moment. I think it's worth pondering what was happening in the late 18th and early 19th centuries in America that catalyzed the rise of racially distinct denominations. For many Americans today, particularly Protestant Americans, the fact that people created new denominations, even racially based ones, might not seem like a big deal. Americans like choice, so we create choices. And, so the thinking goes, people largely choose to congregate with folks like them, 
different denominations for different races make sense, just like 8 a.m. services for people who like hymns and 10.30 services for people who like praise choruses make sense. But let's think about that a bit. That line of reasoning seems to assume either that racial divisions are theologically innocuous, or at least no bigger deal than separating the shine Jesus shine people from the oh for a thousand tongues to sing people. Or it assumes that race names something so profound that people need to divide over it. Just like predestinarians and Arminians or adult baptism and infant baptism folks might have a hard time coexisting in a congregation, so too white people and black people. But remember our earlier episodes. Racial categories do not name real differences, but constructed ones. And they are not innocuous. In our country, racial categories were used to identify who has power and who really belongs. Around the same time the congregants of St. George's were saying that Allen didn't really belong at the altar because of his race, the United States declared that he didn't really belong to the nation for the same reason. In 1790, the newly formed United States of America issued its first Naturalization Act, or a law explaining which immigrants could be granted the status of citizen. Only free white persons of good character could become citizens. The law was a powerful signal about who was seen of worthy of citizenship and who was not. People coming from Europe could, after a period of time, become citizens. People forcibly removed from Africa could not become citizens. Moreover, it wasn't clear that black people born in the United States, even if free, were citizens. Even in the North, not all states allowed black people to vote. For many white Americans, the new country was supposed to be a white country. And that was true even for many white people who opposed slavery. You can see that conviction in one of the popular solutions to slavery in the 19th century, colonization. In response to white people who wondered what would happen if black slaves were freed, the implication being that they couldn't simply become citizens and be integrated into the body politic, some anti-slavery activists argued that black people could be sent back to Africa. They, together with some slave owners who wanted all free black people removed from the South lest they foment slave rebellion, formed the American Colonization Society in 1816. And let's be clear, this wasn't a proposal to offer recent arrivals from Africa a comfortable return to land from which they had been kidnapped. It was a proposal to take people who had lived their whole lives in the United States, whose parents and grandparents had lived their whole lives in the United States, to take those people and then send them to a place about which they knew nothing. Although widespread colonization never occurred, many prominent Americans, including Abraham Lincoln, supported it. And although it was always debated within the black community, some 13,000 Americans resettled in what is today Liberia, hoping to create a nation without racism. The colonization plan demonstrated that for many white Americans, race named who was really American. It also, of course, continued to name those people who were naturally slaves. Identifying people as black and white was not like, say, identifying people as contemporary worship lovers and hymn singers. It wasn't about personal preference. It was about who was seen as someone who belonged in America and who was not. All of which is to say this. The history of separate denominations and, in our day, largely separate congregations for black people and white people in this country should give us pause. To be clear, I'm not blaming Richard Allen for starting a new denomination. When your race matters more to your fellow congregants than the sanctity of your prayers, separation may be your only real option. But I am suggesting that the fact that many African Americans felt like their full humanity could only be recognized in separate churches, a reality unfortunately for many African Americans still, it's not something to be written off as a simply innocuous matter of preference. The rise of evangelical Christianity profoundly changed the landscape of U.S. religion. 
evangelicalism became the dominant form of Christianity in the United States during the 19th century. Methodist and Baptist, both evangelical, became the two largest Protestant groups in the country. With the rise of evangelicalism, black Americans converted to Christianity in large numbers. In the North, African Americans could create their own denominations. In the South, they still often had to worship under the supervision of white people. But we also know that many slaves worshiped together secretly, creating what historian Albert Rabateau called the invisible institution. In brush arbors and creek beds, slaves gathered to hear what they would not in white churches, that God was on the side of the enslaved and desired freedom for his children. Some white evangelicals, however imperfectly, also recognized the egalitarian message in their faith. Charles Finney, the most famous evangelist of the early 19th century, declared slavery a sin. Evangelical denominations like the Wesleyan Church and the Free Methodist made opposition to slavery denominational policy. But many white evangelicals made peace with slavery. Some positively embraced it. Some decided that the evangelistic cost of an abolitionist stance was too high, a position that raises real questions about the point at which you so capitulate to a culture in order to be able to convert people that you're no longer converting them to the gospel of Jesus. And, as we will see in the next episode, some evangelicals understood their faith as blessing a social order based on hierarchy and race. And they were even ready to go to war to defend it.